Good afternoon, everyone. I think we can start. Um, very warm welcome um, this afternoon to speak about fascinating, complicated, and sensitive situations. Today we have Professor Cyrus Shaig, who will share his thoughts on the conflict. He will speak for about 15 minutes in a three-part um, discussion. Then we will have ample, ample time for Q&A. So I really encourage you to ask your questions. The only limit that we have is time, because uh, Cyrus needs to leave at 1.30 sharp. So we might have some of your questions not answered, but at least we'll have about 45 minutes um, for the Q&A. So we'll have a good opportunity. So Professor Cyrus Schreig, you, you, you teach here at the Graduate Institute, and you actually teach a course um, on the conflict this semester. So tell us a bit, little bit about your thoughts. Thank you so much, and thank you for moderating. Um, I'm sorry I have to leave at 1.30 sharp. We have a department meeting, which is sensitive. I'll need to return to it. Let me start with a few um, points about myself, because I think it's important for you to see where I've come from personally. So, my name is Cyrus Shayek, my mother is Swiss, my father is Iranian from a Jewish Baha'i background. I have family in Israel, and I am married to a Lebanese, Egyptian, Armenian woman who grew up in the United States. <laughs> the last thing matters as well because I have learned a lot from her, okay? Um, second quick point, um, how I see, very broadly speaking, 7th of October, I think it was a absolutely unjustifiable civilian massacre. There is nothing that justifies it. And a verge on Israel's war on Gaza, it is, as far as I can see, genocidal. I want you to know where I stand here. I should maybe add here a third point, which is that although we talk about the two sides, and I just did talk about the two sides side by side, these two sides are not now, and they have, in effect, since 1917, never been as symmetric. One, with all sorts of qualifications, has always been in different ways more powerful, and that is, of course, the Zionist and then Israeli one. The other one, the Palestinian one, has always been less powerful. This shows also now, I think, um, obviously. Um, and it also shows uh, the effects of Palestinian statelessness, which was another outcome besides the Nakba of the 1948 war. Now, let me say quickly which three points I will cover. First, I want to give you a bit of historical background. Second, I want to talk a little bit about the Jewish-Israeli view of 7th of October and the war. And last but not least, I do want to talk about the regional and the global dimensions. I do want to talk about the first two things because I really think it is central that people understand not only the big contours, but see a little bit better and a little bit more intimately what's going on in Israel and in Palestine itself. So, number one, historical background. Zionism was from the start, and in some sense, it still is two things at one. It is a national liberation movement, and it is a settler colonial movement. It was that from the start. These two things from the start always also interpenetrated and were interlinked. The thing is that since 1967, at the very latest, and that is, of course, the time when Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza and some other, um, basically, parts um, of historic Palestine, the thing is that since then, slowly, and since the last 25 years, ever more fastly, the national liberation bit, if you want, the national bit, if you want, has become ever more right-wing. And at this point has really spawned parties that by any definition need to be called fascist. Okay? And by the way, some of these fascist thoughts are shared by some people, not all, by some people in the governing Likud party. The other thing is that the settler colonial part of what Zionism is, has become ever more powerful. That is also because of the occupation. The occupation, in other ways, has basically boomeranged back on Israel. As it turns out, one cannot forever occupy another people without, on some level and at some point, starting to be directly affected by this reality. This has also meant that, this also means that the, the war that's going on on Gaza 
doesn't really come out of nowhere. It's something that has built up. It is something that has built up in the rhetoric, in the discourse, in the view of the other on the Israeli side. And in turn, of course, one also needs to say that the way in which Hamas basically um, committed the massacre of 7th of October also is a build up. Hamas attacked installations on the other side of the Gaza frontier a few years back, I think in 2019 or 2018. At that point in time, it only attacked military installations. It left civilians alone. It could have done so again now. It didn't, and it massively didn't, uh, which also shows that there is a mutual escalation, has always been a mutual escalation between these two sides. Now, let me move on to my second point, okay? Jewish-Israeli views of the 7th of October massacre and the war. For, I would assume most of you, 7th of October on some level is now past. It's history. It has been replaced by the pictures that we see that come out of Gaza. This is not the case for Jewish-Israelis, okay? For Jewish-Israelis, the opposite is the case. They are still stuck within 7th October. This is partly because they know a lot of people and it's a very, very tightly integrated, socially tightly integrated society. It's partly also because some people for their own motive, partly political, partly commercial, keep airing certain things, okay? Um, Israelis see 7th of October not as a, an exception. They see it as part of a pattern, and that pattern has a name. Its name is Holocaust. Now, you may disagree or agree with this sort of you know, analysis, but for a lot of Israelis, not everybody, but for a lot of them, on some way, in some way or another, 7th of October is the outcome of a reality of Jewish life in the modern and pre-modern period that peaked in the Holocaust, and in this sense, the Holocaust has never really receded. We can talk more about this later. This also means that Israelis see themselves ultimately, and not even ultimately, as the victim. Again, not all of them, but the majority of them. And if you are a victim, and if you think that you're faced with absolute evil, you are allowed to do anything you want, okay? Israelis are really doing everything they want now. And I think that the genocidal war that is being unleashed may become a turning point. It may become a crystallization and acceleration point of the trend towards the really extreme right in Israeli society. But perhaps, and I hope this will be the case, not the least for my family members who live there, it will maybe be a turning point. Maybe at some point, people will realize that you can't simply kill so many people, not simply unpunished, but without really blemishing your own collective and individual soul. I think this is really, this is really what's, what's really, to me at the very least, really what's central here. Now, I'll add two, three more bits about particular institutional and political actors here, okay? For the security establishment, 7th of October was both an individual and a collective failure, right? And we can talk more about this later. And I think the shock that Israelis in general felt was felt by people in the security establishment as well. And I would say that at the very least one bit of the reaction that has come in the sort of war that we have been seeing is basically pure vengeance. And people have talked about this in Israel itself. This is not something I'm saying. A lot of people in Israel say this, okay? There's also something else, and that is an extreme way of basically rebuilding what is called deterrence, right? So if you kill 700 or whatever, 800, or if you include the army basically soldiers 1,200 of ours, we will kill 10 times, 20 times, 30 times as many of yours so that you will think doubly next time before you do this. The thing, though, is that the way in which Terence is now being handled is very different from how it used to be. Israel used to fight short wars for different reasons, political, external legitimacy, economic, financial. You know how much this costs? It's insane, right? Internal, basically, domestic peace, and so on and so forth. This is not the case anymore. This is basically a long, long war. 
okay, that Israelis at the very least in their minds are fighting. So there is a real, there is a continuity here that has to do with this issue of deterrence and there is a real change here too in military sort of, you know, um, thought. We can talk about this more later on. Netanyahu comes into this sort of um, equation as well. Basically, fundamentally, he wants to survive. He doesn't want to go to prison. He wants to survive politically. And as before September of October, during this time of basically the constitutional overthrow, and right now, he will do anything it takes, but anything it takes, including being, as he did before 7th October, being in bed with the most fascist bedfellows you can imagine, okay? People who say things that you would never talk to these people again if they would say this here, right? If they would write this here, right? He's willing to do this, simply to survive, okay? This gets me to my third point, and that's the regional and global dimensions. Let me just go through a couple of main actors, state actors in this case. One thing that's interesting is that China and Russia have basically been missing in action. It's interesting to think about part, particularly because a lot of people for a long time have said in the last five years, maybe even 10, that the United States is you know, basically exiting the Middle East, that they don't really have it anymore, what it takes to basically intervene and so on and so forth, and that the Chinese and the Russians are amping up and coming. Right now, we see something quite different. Second, the United States. Here, I simply want to talk about two things. First, the means that the United States in principle has and could use vis-a-vis -vis and against Israel if it really would want to stop it. There are military means. It can simply basically stop you know, deploying weapons. There are diplomatic means that we saw yesterday in action at the UN. There are political means, all sorts of different pressures onto the Israeli political system, and we have seen this in action too, although everything, of course, really, really sort of, you know, on, on a very, very low level still, right? And there are economic means that could be used. So why isn't the United States government using these means? Well, there are all sorts of different reasons, right? I think one has to do with simply the age and the generation of the president. He grew up at the time, in the 1970s, politically speaking, when Israel, at the very least, could be seen as still being not as powerful as it is now. Still somewhat the David vis-a-vis -vis the Goliath. Not really, actually, when you know history, but they could be seen as such. This is the Israel he knows, and that's the Israel to which he feels an affinity to, a very strong affinity, in actual fact. So there is a generational sort of issue here. There is a broader cultural issue here as well, and a political one, which is that a lot of people in the Democratic Party at this point, probably a, a big plurality, maybe half, particularly older people, still feel this affinity towards Israel as well. Younger people tend not to. By the way, also some younger Republicans, really interesting, okay? And there is, related to this, of course, a sort of a cultural ideological alliance. There is this myth, really, that this is basically an alliance of values that Israel is a, ultimately a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, and it is very often called, and hence that there are, that this is a you know, really important issue. And when I say myth, I don't mean to say that democracy doesn't exist in Israel. It definitely does, okay? But I would say that it is a democracy that basically operates with two different yardsticks for Jews and for Arabs, okay, for Jews and for Palestinian Israelis. And it, of course, is also democracy. That's a colonial government. It's a little bit complicated, okay? Um, so all of this, plus the fact that Israel is such a technological military intelligence gathering giant in the Middle East, makes it really difficult for the Americans to definitely not cut, cut the line, they will never do this, but even to downgrade basically its stance. It has been doing so in the last four months, but really, really slowly, and of course, much, much too slowly for all the victims in Gaza. That goes just without saying, okay? <coughs> A quick bit about the European Union. The European Union has some political and some economic leverages over the Israelis as well. But the Israelis have a very, very big political and partly also strategic leverage also over the European Union. The strategic leverage is roughly the same that they have vis-a-vis -vis the United States, although the United States, of course, is a state actor and the European Union is not. The political leverage that the Israelis have is called the Holocaust. Okay, the Holocaust happened in Europe. 
not all Europeans, of course, participated equally. It goes without saying that Germany basically led the whole thing and planned the whole thing. But what this means is that there still is a considerable reticence in many European capitals to really take the Israelis to task. This has been the case for decades, okay, decades. What is going on now can't really be compared to what happened before. I mean, in 1982, by the way, the Israelis literally killed tens of thousands of people in Beirut as well, okay? So it's not the total first, but there was no TikTok and no social media and things of this sort at that point in time, although Reagan called then Prime Minister Begin and told him, stop this Holocaust. That's Reagan, okay, in 1982. So there are some precedents, but there is also real build up here, okay? Uh, and I think, and, and it, but although there has been a real build up, the Europeans have always been quite, yeah, reticent to basically get out of the shadow of the Holocaust in their own right. Iran, next point. <coughs> Iran started to build in the early 2000s a network of allies, non-state actors in the Middle East. It did so partly out of reasons of offense that in some ways paralleled what they tried to do in the 1980s, when it really tried to export a revolution. Partly it did so out of defensive reasons, because the United States you know, invaded Afghanistan in 01, and then in Iraq in 03, and as it did that, said that Iran is part of the axis of evil, and the Iranians were afraid they would be next, and in order to basically make themselves look bigger, they started to build this alliance network. So that's a big sort of advantage that the Iranians have also vis-a-vis -vis the Israelis, right? Um, it is also even something that can be used sort of, you know, more offensively and, you know, it, it, it is being used more offensively, right? Um, at the same point in time, all these allies are not Iran's proxies. They are not little marionettes that do Iran's dance. They really have their own mind. If push comes to shove, the Iranians can force them to shut down certain things. So in early January, the Syrian and the Iraqi Shi allies of, um, of Iran basically agreed to stop attacking US installations. And they, they protested. They said, we don't want to stop. And the Iranians basically made them do it. But uh, uh, below this very high threshold of Iranian acceptance of what these allies do, they can roughly do what they want. And Hamas, of course, did what he wanted without basically partly being able and partly actually wanting to advertise or basically warn the Iranians ahead of time. So this is an important player that's basically, you know, happening here. Vis-a-vis -vis it is, of course, Israel on the one side and still loosely related to it, the so-called moderate Arab countries that have a peace agreement with it, and that's Egypt and Jordan, and perhaps as importantly, the Gulf Arab countries and Saudi Arabia that have a very complicated relationship vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Because on the one side, they want to technologically profit from it and economically profit from it and do business with it. And they also are willing to entertain the notion of having some sort of defense arrangement, a technological defense arrangement with them. It has to do with anti-aircraft and basically anti-ballistic missiles, you know, shields. But at the same point in time, they need to somewhat, somewhat heed domestic opinion. And as you can imagine, domestic opinion now is firmly against the, basically the, the, per, the prosecution of these, of these particular alliance aims. Um, why do they need the Israelis to maybe state the obvious? They do or need the Israelis, not need, but why would it make a certain sense for them to basically, you know, have an alliance of some technological sort, not political, but of some technological sort <coughs> with the Israelis, which is overviewed and overlooked by the, uh, by the Americans vis-a-vis -vis Iran. That's, of course, sort of the other big, you know, the other big um, power in the, in the region that, con that, concerns the, that concerns the Saudis and concern other Gulf states. Okay, so I think I'll leave things at this. So I went a little bit over time, um, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cyrus, for uh, 
taking us a bit more deeper into this, um, the insights of the perceptions that are at play in this conflict. Before I open the, the, the floor uh, to the public, allow me just to also to spark the discussion to ask you two very quick questions. Um, what, in your view, would be the possible scenario, um, either political or even hopefully leading to, to peace uh, in the region? And the second question is that you talked about international actors, the EU, the US. Now we are in an electing year, uh, election year in the US. What would be the impact of a possible and hopefully not change of presidency in the US with the election of Trump, for example? Thank you so much, and again, thank you for moderating. Um, so re-question one. Both questions, I think, don't have a clear answer. And I think that certainly for Palestinians in Gaza right now, any notion of you know, peace with Israel is really quite far from their mind, because their daily reality is one of bare survival, and of course, you know, tens of thousands have, have already died. Um, similarly, but at the same point very differently, Israelis too can really not think about peace right now, I would say. Israelis are really sort of in a fog. This is when you read the press and you hear people talking, what people say most is that we are exhausted. We are exhausted from this from this war, from this war, from all that happened before with, the, with Netanyahu's government, whether you're in favor or against. Um, this government, by the way, is totally dysfunctional. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, that's not what we're talking about now, but it's really unbelievable, okay? Like, just on the administrative level, what it is not able to do, okay? Um, and so, I think the, 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 that's, that's the, that needs to be the first sort of part of the answer to, to your first question. The second part is, a, a basically a really big a really big conundrum without palestinians without direct and central palestinian participation in any build up of gaza and in any administration of the west bank that then hopefully will lead to an independent state that's at least my opinion without them there can be no durable anything. We neither ceasefire nor peace process and definitely not sort of a faraway peace. The problem and the conundrum comes in in that Israelis are still at the, a lot, a good number of Israelis simply don't want any Palestinians to do anything. And a majority of, Pal of Israelis basically already to maybe think about this, but in a way that's simply not acceptable to Palestinians. So this is, I think, right now, the basic conundrum. People can change your opinion. And I think if a strong, I don't mean a fascist, but if a self-convinced leader who has some sort of way of going forward, if somebody like this would emerge, it's possible that people will go after him. It's a him at this point in time. There's basically almost no hers in Israeli politics and also not in Palestinian politics, okay? Very few. Um, so I don't think it's totally impossible, but there is this basic conundrum, right? Um, Rior, second question, I, you know, I, I, for the longest time I thought that if Trump would become president again, first of all, we really don't know. Partly because Trump also really, you know, shifts left and right. For the longest time, I thought that if he basically becomes president, he will basically revert to what he did in the first time, which is to go towards Israel in a way in which he never has before. He also did some other things, by the way, but it's a little bit complicated. But as of late, you hear him say a lot, you know, like, you definitely need to shut it down, and Netanyahu can't be trusted. Um, so I think it's a really hard one. It's, I think it's really hard. And, and, and perhaps it's not going to be a total change of policy, or it would be a total change of policy, policy would he be elected? So it, I think it's really, it's really hard to say. You, you can see things point into both directions. I would maybe point it like, put it like that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now it's your time to ask question. We do also have uh, a wide participation online. So I will take some questions here in the room and also turn to online uh, participation. And we already have some questions here. 
before asking your question, kindly introduce yourselves first. Um, and also, if it's possible, please state a question rather than uh, doing lengthy comments so that we have enough time for everyone to, to participate to the discussion. So who would like to start? A courageous person. Yes, please. Wait, wait for the mic, it's coming. <laughs> uh, hello, thank you for the talk. I'm a first year student here at the Institute. Um, and my question is very briefly, who is winning the war at the moment? Um, and because uh, like quickly, um, Ilan Bappé said um, that it's the end of the Zionist project or something this. So could you elaborate on that? Thank you. Yeah. I can tell you who is losing. Who is losing are Palestinian civilians. That's very clear. Who is winning in the short term right now, militarily speaking, it's probably some sort of take on It's probably some sort of balance. Because after five and more months, Hamas is still standing. And actually, it's popping back up. It's like whack-a-mole. You hit here, it pops up there, etc. So I don't think this looks particularly good for the Israelis, although they have killed you know, probably thousands of Hamas fighters like in the process. This is not the end of the Zionist project. Okay? Um, it can be a redefinition of the Zionist project. And I can, well, let me say, it's not the end of the Zionist project because Israelis are not going to go away. Like Palestinians, they are not going to go away. So whatever we hope, whatever we want, whatever we desire, we need to just accept this reality. It's there, okay? But both societies can develop into different directions. My fear is that this experience will make Israelis even more go into the fascist direction, and there will be an next round which will be even worse. But my hope is that at some point, enough people will start to realize what they have done. Also consider this, there's almost no protest, none. And there's a couple of hundred people here and a couple of hundred people there. Posterity will think about this, because one thing is to commit something, and another thing is not to say anything when it happens in your name. Which, by the way, is also something that I think Jews outside Israel should think hard about. Okay? I'm not saying this to say that anti-Semitism is justified because it plain isn't. But the way Israel has time and time again, for decades, talked in the name of Jewish communities all the way around the world, indirectly, not voluntarily, but indirectly, unfortunately, implicates Jews. This is a real problem. Some Jewish communities as a whole and some Jews as individuals have started to draw their, their conclusion and are basically disengaging, some more silently and others more directly and openly. Sorry, long answer. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you so much. I'm a third year PhD student in international history and politics. And two questions. You mentioned Egypt very briefly. Could you talk a little bit about the, the news or allegations that Egyptian security services had warned Israel about the October 7th attack? I'm not sure how much about that that is verifiable. I'd love to hear more about that. And then also the brewing slash possible uh, full war with Lebanon if you can speak on that. Yeah. And just as a quick comment about the, the Israeli protests, you also mentioned 1982, that there were very strong protests in Israel yes. in response to the Sabra and Shatila massacre. That's so true. it is interesting to look historically yeah. on the protest movements within Israel itself. Yeah. That's Thank you. a very important point you're making, yes. And we don't see any of this now, which is interesting. Uh, Egyptian security forces indeed warned Israeli authorities, but warned of what? It wasn't really clear. I don't know the exact wording. I don't know whether this is known. I do know that Israelis, for the longest time, were under the impression, this is called the security conception, that Hamas is basically here, is basically interested in surviving economically and building up government structures, OK? Um, and so any information that went against this, against this conception was either ignored or basically put away. Yeah. Read the North, I mean, I don't quite know where this is going, but I can tell you that 
the way Israel has in the last three to four weeks repeatedly attacked Hezbollah targets not in the border area, but further up north, 100 kilometers, 90 kilometers north from the border in Baalbek, indicates that perhaps some people in the Israeli security establishment actually have an interest in doing what they wanted to do at the very start of the war, which is to basically trigger a full-on full war with Hezbollah. They were shot down by Netanyahu, by the way, who was against this, and by the Americans, who were against this too. Okay, and by day, I seen the, the, the person who basically headed this was Yoav Gallant, the, the Minister of Defense. So it's possible that they're trying to just provoke Hezbollah, and Hezbollah is hitting back, but they're still hitting back within the border, the border area of Israel. It's a, very, it's a very complicated sort of tit-for-tat game, right? Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. If there is a ceasefire in Gaza, there will likely be a ceasefire in the north as well. And there was last time. I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be. But the Israelis are now have an issue with how Hezbollah is positioned in south and Lebanon, which, by the way, is against UN resolutions passed over 2006. Okay, so. They're saying we gave diplomacy a, a, a basically a go, trying to push his dollar back 10 kilometers maybe north of the border, but if they don't do this long term, they'll need to take them out. Of course, which of course is not going to, it's not going to work, but that's an entirely separate story. Thank you. Perhaps I will go online just to make, um, just to be fair. Um, so we have a couple of questions online, and I will start with the first one, uh, which is asked by uh, Mr. Um, Reinhard Huss, who's saying that the UN Partition Plan of 1947 had two options. One proposed a one-state solution with separate Palestinian and Jewish entities. Why was this plan rejected and has never been revived? Um, there are different reasons why it was rejected. Um, the, the principal reason, I think, ultimately, is because neither Israelis nor Arabs, Palestinians didn't have an official vote or an unofficial one at that point in time. Um, you know, really were interested in a one state solution or one state, in a one state that would treat both of them equally. Certainly not at that point in time. And certainly on the Israeli side, I don't know the Palestinian side, certainly not now. Um, it's interesting that support for the two state solution has sort of slowly declined among Israelis, um, and the war has not helped. But I think it's a sort of flatlining, but it may be building up again. And I do think that I do think that it's possible that if enough sufficient pressure is brought to bear from the outside, principally in the United States, and if there is enough political organization on the Israeli side, and there are some people who are trying to do this, okay, that long term something may work. What's also interesting is that in the latest Palestinian polls, there has been a strong surge in Palestinian support for a two-state solution, for reasons that I'm sure you can understand. Okay, a second question. Sorry, I'm just asking a second question online since we had two in the floor. Um, the second question online is from Luis, who is a graduate student from Panama in the 80s. And he wanted to know whether you were caught by surprise by yesterday's UNSC resolution that agreed um, on, on a ceasefire in the region. Not really, because the United States had already, you know, basically initiated a not dissimilar solution itself, and because you could see that this is politically building up. All right, so let's go back to the room. Uh, we have one sir in the middle here who was raising his hands for a while. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Mike Parmley. I'm the husband of a, an Ashby graduate, uh, which allows me to, to come in here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I was wondering, uh, Professor, first of all, thank you very much for a very enlightened talk. Um, I was wondering what you thought of Senator Chuck Schumer's speech uh, a couple of weeks ago 
uh, in the Senate. Uh, and whether you think it, it indicates a movement or whether Chuck Schumer was just speaking for himself, period. No, it definitely indicates a movement. What's interesting is that he isn't 25, but whatever, in his 70s, and that he's, yes, he I think the most the most pro-Israeli voting record in the Senate, or one of the most, okay? So this, is, this was really, this was a turning point of sorts. Turning points very often are only seen later on. So it, but it's not something you can walk back, right? So I think it, it I think for internal domestic US politics, for domestic Israeli politics, and also for the relationship between US Judaism or Jewry and Israel, this, is a, this, this will be a date remembered. Thank you. Yes, please, madam. Thank you, Michal. I'm the head of the, um, I'm, I'm, I work here in student services. Um, I have a million questions. I'll ask this one. Thinking about the day after, which nobody seems to understand how that's, you know, how it's going to happen, can you help us understand how the Palestinians are thinking about the day after? I have to admit this is something that I do not understand. I don't understand how Palestinian politics function. We know that there is the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank that has its weaknesses. Um, we know that we don't know who is the leadership. Is there a legitimate leadership in Gaza? Has there ever been? Um, how did the current leadership get to be where they are? What are their plans? What are their strategies yeah. for themselves and for the people who, for better, for lack of a better term, are somehow have ended up under their charge? Um, in terms of legitimacy, in terms of state building, in terms of credibility, in terms of vulnerability to outside influence, whatever those may be. Yeah. What do they want and how are they going to achieve it and how likely are they to be able to achieve their goals? Yeah. So let me start by again saying that I think definitely for Palestinians in Gaza, um, this is not really what's foremost on their mind right now, number one. Number two, and there is a basic problem, which is that the internal tensions between different Palestinian factions, principally the PA, which is mainly fed by Fatah, although there are some Fatah people who are really not part of the PA, and Hamas and a couple of smaller groups, these tensions that were active before October are still active now, and maybe they have become even stronger, okay? Part of the tension can be explained by Israeli divide and rule, but only some of it. Um, it's really unclear where this is going. It's a bit of a zero-sum game. There is talk of a technocratic government, even Hamas sort of embraced this, but then like how it's done is not like enough. There was of course pressure on the PA to self-reform. The person that has been put in charge is basically an insider. So this is... Um, <laughs> The Palestinians have the basic problem that they are stateless, that they still don't have a state, so they need others, but others, including a lot of, you know, definitely moderate Arab regimes, are not really enamored with them, to say the very least. So they are in a really hard spot, but it also seems to be the case that for different political reasons of political power, really self-preservation of political power, these different groups are not, uh, definitely not at the moment, able and willing to really put the differences aside. We have two questions online uh, that um, I want to make sure that uh, are asked to you. One of the question is, um, who are the actors in the region and at the global level that can support a just, uh, a just and sustainable solution to the conflict? And if I may, I'm going to ask you the second question. Uh, what are um, the the possibilities or the risk, of the risk of an intervention by Israel's neighbors or enemies? The risk of intervention? Yes, yeah. military intervention, I guess. I think the, that there is also here a basic conundrum. The uh, actually sort of two, there is a conundrum and there is a problem. So let me start with the problem. The problem as far as the so-called moderate Arab regimes goes is that they are at this point quite loath 
to do what they used to do earlier, which is to simply finance the rebuilding of Gaza after like an, an Israeli war. Of course, those Israeli wars just pale in comparison to what's going on now, okay? But, you know, Qatar and some others basically were willing to step in and build up for their own political purposes, of course, right? Nobody is an angel here, right? Um, but, and this is the problem, they are not willing to do this as long as it seems, and they definitely this is the reality now, that the Israelis are simply going to do this again. They did this a couple of times, so like, we are done with this, right? It also looks bad politically at home, by the way. It's not only a financial issue. I mean, the financial issue for them is negligible. They're so rich. So that's the problem. The conundrum is political. There are a few countries, like, namely Turkey, less so Qatar, who have the legitimacy to actually get involved. They also have the means. But they have the legitimacy because they're much closer to Hamas in the, for different reasons than the other countries. So this, this gives them a certain in, right? But precisely because they have this sort of legitimacy, definitely Turkey, partly also Qatar, are not really fully acceptable sort of you know, partners for the Israelis. I mean, Qatar at this moment still is. I don't know how this is going to turn out long term. So there is a bit of a, there's this problem and there is this conundrum. Thank you. Let's go back a bit in the room. Yes, please, sir. So I'm, I'm just trying to, to have everyone, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Rami. I'm a first-year Mint student. I'm in both of your classes, actually, so hopefully you recognize me. Um, uh, I, uh, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about the role of, the, of Arab public opinion, because it seems to me like there's a bit of a disconnect between Arab governments and the Arab public. Yeah. Uh, and so I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit, yeah. please. Yeah, definitely. Is this big this uh, disconnect? Um, it shows least in the Emirates because the Emirates is the state that is most steadfast in keeping the sort of relationship it has now with Israel. Um, but it does show in other countries. But it has shown at different points. So there, there have been some waves of demonstrations. But it's not that the entire Arab world is continuously demonstrating in by the hundreds of thousands in the streets, right? So on the one side, this bottom-up pressure definitely constrains what Arab countries, states can do. And it actually dictates a good bit of their um, rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But at the same point in time, at the very least right now, it seems to me that it isn't, it, and, you know, we used to see truth, right? I mean, the Jordanians and the Egyptians haven't, for instance, cut their diplomatic relations with Israel. They have called back their ambassador, but that's it, right? So there are these two parts to my answer. Thank you. Yes, please. I have been trying to raise my hand, too. I know. I'm trying to have um, Hi. Thanks so much. Um, for your insights, I'm a third year PhD candidate in the history department, just like Stella. And um, I think I have a question about, because a lot of the governments that, um, for example, in the UK and in the US as well, the red line is very much backing the two-state solution. So I'm wondering, in light of what's happening and sort of the conflicting behavior that we're seeing at Security Council votes, et cetera, although now it seems to be, there seems to be a consensus, I'm wondering, do you think that going forward there is like, is this even a possibility? Is this a realistic solution, given that the um, borderline fascist Israeli government has been speaking about just a total destruction of the Palestinian people? But that, so that doesn't align at all with the sort of hope for a two-state solution. I'm just wondering practically, um, in terms of state sovereignty, what, how do you see this moving forwards? What do you think about this? I don't know if this is an impossible question, but I'd be very curious to know what you think. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Well, I'm not going to look into the crystal. Well, I, I can see different crystal balls. <laughs> I should maybe put it like this, right? 
and each one is anchored in a certain part of the, of the current reality. I can see one future where fascism wins even more. I can see that future is possible, right? But, and that would include the Israelis saying, you know what? You Americans, you don't want to support us as much as you do? Duh. Who cares? We will, we will do this on our own. We'll work more with the Indians. They love us. You know, we'll do this. We'll do that. We're strong enough to do this on our own. This is a possible future. Another possible future is simply chaos, that it will simply and maybe this is the most likely solution, at the very least, sort of in the, in the, in the midterm, you know, in the next like six months, eight months, something like that, right? And by chaos, I mean more or less that's the situation that you have now. And there is a future that, you know, points towards, at the very least, the start of a, pro of a process of, of negotiation, of, of, of talk. And that, I think, is grounded in the fact that the United States and the EU, for, to say one thing, are now more critical of what the Israelis can do and also start to understand that the Israelis are behaving in such a way that it really is becoming both a domestic and an international problem for them and that you do have at the very least a kernel of support, a strong kernel of support actually in Israel for some sort of maybe not two states, but at the very least two entity solution to quote a word that is also used. Is this gonna be enough for Palestinians? I doubt it. But is it better than what there is now? I don't know. It depends whom you would ask. Let's just put it like this. OK, we have time for one last question. And perhaps you can have, OK, so two last questions. Um, yes, please. And yes, please. And then. write you in private, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a PhD student in art history and a graduate of the American University of Beirut. And I wondered um, how likely, I guess two quick questions, how likely do you think a ground invasion of Rafah is at this point? And how much are the dire economic conditions in Lebanon and Egypt affecting their ability to act? Say the second thing again. The economic conditions in Lebanon and in Egypt, how it's limiting their what they could possibly do to um, diplomatically or politically come up with a solution or be a part of a, a more regional solution. Um, I'm starting to think, re your first question, that Rafah, a possible invasion of, is a very handy in domestic political gun for Netanyahu to have on the table. I'm not so sure anymore he really wants to go there. But it's very convenient for him to say, we really want to do this, but bad Uncle Sam is not, is not allowing us to do. And you know, if, let's say, by any definition, Israel loses the war without having invaded Rafah, Netanyahu will always be able to say, told you so. It was not, I tried. They didn't allow me, right? So I think. So at the very least, on his account, I think this is where we are at. I'm not so sure the security establishment wants a full-scale invasion. Not so sure. There you hear different things. You hear different people say different things. At the very least, there are some people in the defense, basically in the war cabinet right now, most importantly, you know, eyes and cotton guns, who really think that the war, as, in, as it used to look like in the first, definitely in the first phase, but also in the second phase, from the Israeli perspective, they're different phases. From the Palestinian perspective, this doesn't really make a big difference. But from the Israeli perspective, there is this, okay? They basically think this is over. Like, we need to move, we need to move tactics now and also strategy, okay? Read the Lebanese and the Egyptians, look, um, both of them are really teetering <laughs> economically. I mean. If, 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 if something serious happens it, like economically to Egypt, the sort of crisis the Middle East will go into and the sort of refugee crisis we will have in Europe, I mean, it will make Syria look like a, like a cake, like, like a walk in the park, you know? It's like, how many people are there now in Egypt? Rami? 100 million. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, 
and the, that, of course, but this being said, the two are, of course, very different from each other, right? Egypt is extremely centralized. There are clear people who are really in charge. Lebanon is more or less the exact opposite. So what this means is like really, really hard to say. Yeah, I would add one very little bit. You know, everybody always says, and bottom line, they're right, that Israeli occupation of Gaza never ended. This is correct. But I do think that we need to add a little asterisk there and also recognize that the Egyptians were not unhappy to basically help the Israelis do this. I mean, they were also not unhappy to turn the other eye and let all sorts of different tunnel systems you know, run their course. That's true as well, right? But there is an Egyptian role in this siege of Gaza that we have seen since 2007. I think that needs to be mentioned. Excellent. So now I'm afraid it's going to be the last question sure. and the last answer if sure. you want to leave on time. Sure. So please, Christina. <coughs> I think it's better. Christina, I'm an alumna of this um, this place. Uh, thank you very much. Extremely insightful um, talk. One piece that I'm missing in this regional outlook is the stance of Turkey. And I'm glad that you're talk, talking about Turkey, because if one man can change the name of his country, you know, it's Erdogan. So if you can give us a bit of an outlook, you know, he seems to be, it's a bit, it's a bit silent there. I don't think he's that silent. I mean, he... So I'm Ill on Ill Ill informed. So thank you for your, uh, for your view. Sure. Um, I, I, yes, I mean, look, he could always do more, but I do think that Palestine is a topic that is both personal, personal and political for Erdogan, right? This is something that he really, really believes in. He also has had institutional ties with Hamas from 2006 onwards, at the very least. After the election, Hamas people were, Hamas delegates were invited into Turkey. We know that part of the a few members of the political bureau of Hamas, at the very least, were in Turkey, right? Um, I also think that his very, very powerful civilizational rhetoric, by the way, right? It's, it's like the Crusaders again, it's us against them, and so on and so forth. Um, it's also a rhetoric that I believe, he believes, will help him with a good number of countries in the global south. So it's both, in other words, it's both something that is really heartfelt and politically convenient. And it's both, if you keep in mind that there are some other Muslim collectives, I mean, there are also some Palestinian Christians and Druze, but there are also some other Muslim collectives that principally, in principle, at the very least, should be close to his heart. For instance, the Uyghurs in China. He says precisely peep about them, nothing. They're even Turkic, right? He says nothing about them because he wants to have a good relationship with China, right? So that's, that's what I would say about, about the Turks. Um, so to maybe quickly wrap up, I would say maybe this. One way of looking at the war, horrors aside, its genocidal you know, nature aside, is to sort of look at it as a, as a prism that into which went a lot of different forces and processes on both sides, the Palestinian and the Israeli side, that had already been building up for a very long time. There is no way that Israel would have led such a genocidal type of war without the occupation basically leading to at the very least in part of Israeli society to a real sort of fascistization. It just wouldn't have happened this way, right? There is also no way that Hamas would have attacked the way it did on October 7th if the military command and the people heading the military command in, in, in Hamas in Gaza would have developed ideologically and politically the way they did in the last few years because they didn't quite behave this way before. Nobody there is no such thing as a political DNA that never changes. Think people change. And I think this is a good example. This also means that coming out of this war now, things can really go into different directions. 
This doesn't mean they can go equally into all directions, but it does mean that some parts of the reality that we see now may turn in retrospect, if we will look back in 10 more years from now, will turn in retrospect, will be the core for the reality to emerge. Things may just continue to be chaos. Things may turn out to be much worse. There may be a new round, which will be much worse than what this is now. Or things may also turn, at the very least, in my view, for the better, okay? So I don't think we can make a prediction for what will happen. But what we can do is we can unpack and analyze the past, how it has informed the political and, plainly speaking, psychological, cultural presence at this moment, in the present, and what that may mean for potential future scenarios. Thank you so much for coming.